Hello, I'm Gideon Burton. I want to talk with you about a very important topic within digital culture, crowdsourcing. Jeff Howe defines crowdsourcing as the act of a company or institution taking a function once performed by employees and outsourcing it to an undefined and generally large network of people in the form of, of an open call. It's outsourcing plus crowds. We'll come to see that crowdsourcing is much more than simply a business efficiency and is taking on uh, societal ramifications that, that are pretty large. In order to understand what's going on with crowdsourcing, however, I, I think we need to have a background in user-generated content, which is, is part of Web 2.0, the participatory web. Let me just touch on a few of the, the heavy hitters in this area, and they could be uh, sources that you could look up further if you wanted to. Uh, the Cathedral and the Bazaar. Eric Raymond. This is coming from a very uh, important look at the labor models in software development, which end up being important on a larger scale, especially with respect to open source software. The open movement was, has been an effort that started in the software industry, but it spread beyond that as a way of um, enlisting a lot of people to work for free on a common cause. It started with software and it's moved on to other things. Uh, people like Yokai Benkler have talked about the, uh, the great effect that happens as a lot of people start working together. And so nowadays we, we need to think about networks not just in terms of uh, the IT infrastructure and not in terms of just say your uh, business networking, but networks as a combination of the technical and the social that can yield some pretty amazing things when they're combined. Um, a, cup, uh, a very important author in this area is Clay Shirky, and he's taken Jeff Howe's concepts, and in his book, Here Comes Everybody, gives lots of examples of that, and, and furthers that within his follow-up book called Cognitive Surplus. Essentially, Here Comes Everybody, we, a lot of people are online, and a lot of people have time online, extra time, and with this cognitive surplus, they are, are able to do a lot of interesting work. The best overall work to discuss crowdsourcing is the wisdom of crowds, at least uh, in order to get an initial sense of the power that can come as people work together. Because as Sir Wiki talks about in his book, it isn't simply a matter of more efficiently getting tasks done. Th there's a way in which people working together are smarter than um, themselves alone or computers. And so this is a, a pretty revolutionary because it suggests that there are ways of solving problems and doing um, highly sophisticated work that are, are not part of traditional ways of organizing labor or solving problems. Uh, a very interesting book. I highly recommend The Wisdom of Crowds. Uh, nowadays, we're also crowdsourcing news. Uh, Dan Gilmore, is, is, who's, he's talking about citizen journalism or grassroots journalism, uh, the democratization of news and uh, one of the catchphrases from his work is is the former audience um, people are not passive anymore online they're able to be engaged with what's going on in the world in one way is by uh, following up on and acting upon news items uh, Henry Jenkins he, he's pushed the term participatory culture and this is very much the web 2.0 mindset um, and basically you, because there's such low barriers for doing things um, people are getting more involved and uh, this also ties in with the the creativity that's come with online work and, and easy access to uh, tools for making and creating things so uh, this this ties in with the socially reinforced nature of creativity online as well um, Henry Jenkins very important uh, thinker as far as that goes another uh, tributary in understanding crowdsourcing is uh, knowing about fan culture. Uh, th this is, um, we get a lot of true believers that, that rally around a given, uh, this is like the, the Harry Potter series and, and writing fiction, but they might rally around other things. We have online identities are um, broadening and deepening our attachments and affiliations with specific niche cultures. And that alone motivates us to want to do things together uh, such as creating hundreds of thousands of uh, pages of uh, MuggleNet fanfiction. Okay, 
Another aspect to this that, that ties in with crowdsourcing is the increased uh, do-it-yourself movement. There's, there's so many how-to videos online now, and uh, th this also is the part of the rise of the amateur. And so, so people are trying to um, do new things, learning about it online, and part of that is learning how to do things together and to uh, collaborate. And so you don't just do it all by yourself, but you do it you do it yourself after consulting your online community who, who helps you figure it out. Uh, here's more on the, the news end. Uh, Jay Rosen, very uh, famous thinker about this. Uh, he, he's um, still very actively talking about um, how journalism is changing as we have uh, uncredentialed people that are uh, contributing to the, the news feeds of the day. Uh, part of the, the, the crowdsourcing has to do with um, this the inf information wants to be free people want to to make use of available digital media online in order to create new things and to remix them Lawrence Lessig has been very much at the forefront of this talking about the creative culture and he's been behind also the Creative Commons licensing which is very critical uh, overcoming some of the roadblocks to uh, creativity with things digital because of, of copyright um, and he's he's actually, well, I, I won't tell you everything he's up to, but he's, he's a mover and shaker in this area as well. Uh, collaborative creativity is something that's becoming um, formalized by there being platforms where people can um, not just showcase their art, but also there can be calls for collaboration. And I'll discuss that a little bit further. All right, so all of this together you can see as being part of the participatory culture of Web 2.0 where people are generating content and putting it online, coordinating with other other people and doing new things that haven't been done before. That's the general context for crowdsourcing. Now I want to talk about it in terms of three things. Let's first look at the types of crowd labor that can be done and the laborers who do it and then what they get out of it. So first of all, types of crowd labor. And there, there's a lot of overlap among these categories, but I do think it's, it's useful to kind of distinguish them as very different types of work. There is a, a type of crowdsourced labor that is pretty re repetitive or, or passive. Uh, passive might be that, that you give permission on your iPhone for your location to be identified and, and a service like Waze attracts you along with, you end up being part of a crowd of sensors and so they aggregate this data and are able to give real-time information about traffic jams and, and things like that. Um, there, there's other kind of more, more conscious but just repetitive kinds of crowdsourcing that these people are sometimes referred to as click workers. They work for JPL. Um, there's a, a platform called Crowdflower. Essentially, they, they enlist people to um, put metadata onto existing data as a, as a service. Uh, one example of this is that they have people accurately categorized products on eBay. So not, not highly sophisticated types of thinking. A lot of it's, it's just repetitive, but it ends up being very useful, especially in the aggregate. Second type of crowdsourcing labor, I, I call it judgment work. And this is where you have to have a little bit of an education. Uh, you're giving, a, or at least you're exercising judgment on some level. You, you give a rating or you're tagging something uh, or, or you're involved in mapping work. Um, that's very interesting. I'll mention just the wiki crimes one, mapping crimes collaboratively. This is an effort, uh, uh, I think it's a real-time effort to uh, have people uh, follow up on, on crimes. Think of it as an online neighborhood watch, but uh, empowered by, by people who have the digital resources and databases and maps and so on that can help people that are uh, on the streets. Uh, over on the left side there, we see the CAPTCHA, um, and that is, um, most people have rec recognized that they have to do this at different places online in order to prove that they're not a robot. But it's more than just that. The people who do CAPTCHA are actually, um, you, every time you fill out a CAPTCHA, you are helping to crowdsource the transcription of works that have been digitized for the web. So, um, Computers, OCR, can't always recognize words, uh, but humans do a better job of that, so they break it up into a tiny task of, you know, they get some whole document that 
the computer can't really um, OCR optical character recognition can't do it very well so they break that up even down to the word level and they dish that up to thousands and thousands of people and they they do it more than once and so they get a, a confidence that if several people have all uh, said it's the same word they trust that it's the same word that's considered transcribed and it goes on to the next thing so it's, it's combining uh, a security measure for websites with a, a passive kind of uh, crowdsourcing labor a third and, and highest level of crowdsourcing is more on the creative level and the collaborative level. This is where you can be involved in product design or in, in content production. For example, on Threadless, it's a t-shirt company. You can be actively involved in sub submitting artwork for the t-shirts, but then you can also be part of the, the crowd that, that votes on the t-shirts. And whatever gets the, the most votes, they put into production and sell back to the very people that voted to them. Um, you can you can be uh, part of the crowdsourcing of tattoo designs. Uh, that's an interesting crowdsourced creative thing. My favorite is Compose, which is a, a fascinating music platform where you can go online, create, create an account, and you start a project. And it could be just a, a couple of measures of a melody that you uh, hum into a microphone or that you, you strum on your guitar. You give it a name and then you, you say what types of um, help that you would like on that. Maybe you want some drums, maybe you want a vocalist, maybe you want a violin. And so you essentially put out a, a call for collaboration to these thousands of people that have all created individual profiles. And, and so they will get notification when someone wants the talent that they say they have. And so then you have the opportunity to go in and, and look at a project, decide whether you'd like to contribute to it or not. Uh, if you do, you can, for example, submit your uh, you know saxophone track to somebody's song that they've created. And then it goes through a crowdsourced judgment process where people go in and vote on whether the, the tracks that have been added to the bass track are actually improving the song. And so whoever starts the project is able to um, have the last word on that and decide which tracks that get submitted actually go into the final product. But it's a very fun and creative thing as, as people all over the world with vastly different talents are able to combine their in individual abilities into these, you know, they'll never meet together in the same recording studio, uh, but, but they can create something together. I, I've done this a little bit myself and it's, it's a lot of fun. So crowdsourcing starts taking on a, a different character when all of a sudden it's, it's creative and collaborative and it's not just uh, busy work. Now there are different types of crowd laborers. This is <clears throat> another way of understanding the whole phenomenon. I call the first type worker bees and, and they're the ones that do these highly repetitive tasks uh, that, that are, are pretty mindless. And the next level I, I, refer, to as the <clears throat> I refer to as the commonly skilled laborer. So a place like Galaxy Zoo, this is where astronomers are crowdsourcing the identification of basic types of galaxies. And so they have all these um, uh, pictures that show up and uh, you can sign up for this if you want and be involved. And, and it doesn't take a lot of skill. It just, you basically have to be able to look at a shape of a galaxy, a picture of a galaxy and see what basic shape it aligns with, right? Is this a one of those sombrero-shaped galaxies. I don't know, the, the spiral galaxy. Um, it has a set of galaxies you can choose from and you just have to decide which of this it is. And apparently this is, is very important for uh, astronomers and, and something that um, people can do. Uh, others have, have done crowdsourced bird counts. So ornithologists have, have um, put out to thousands of people online to help them on a given day to count birds of a certain type or location. And um, it sounds like it's a mess, but they, they figured out ways that uh, even with all the uh, uh, margins of error that are involved, that they're able to have more accurate counts than if they just had the few experts that were available uh, to do the bird counting with them. Uh, the, the highest level, and this goes along with the creativity and the, the collaboration, and that is freelancers and experts. Now there's some really fascinating things going on with this. Uh, if you're a freelancer, for example, if you uh, are an, an editor or a computer programmer uh, and you're looking for contracts with clients, you can go to Odesk and put up your shingle and say, these are my skills, put me to work. 
Um, on the other hand, if, if, if you are someone that is um, needing that sort of service, then you can go online, you browse the profiles, people set their own prices. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a clearinghouse for people to uh, buy and sell um, services. A lot of them are, are technical or computer oriented, but not all of them. Um, and it's, it's a growing sort of thing. Uh, so people are able to crowdsource and outsource uh, tasks that they're not able to do and find labor uh, that's cheap online and, and vet those people that are online by looking at their prior work and checking out their profiles. Your Encore is a really fascinating site because it's a, an opportunity for retired experts to still be involved in uh, applying their expertise and they can be uh, rewarded for doing this. Um, uh, the, people think of like a, a retired engineer and so engineering companies will put up tasks that need to be done or problems that need to be solved that their, their own in-house engineers are not able to do. And someone else um, has the time and interest, they can solve it uh, and then there's some compensation for that sort of thing. All right, and, and here, speaking of compensation, here are three different levels. Um, a lot of times people will do crowdsourced labor purely for it as an end in itself. Um, the uh, Latter-day Saints uh, have family search indexing, so they're very interested in genealogical work and, and building family trees. And so they have a, an entire platform that's been created by which people can be issued a very small sample of, say, a, a census, and then they are to um, you know, transcribe the names from the handwritten, the digitized handwritten census record, and, and so that can be formally put into a database. It's highly organized because there's, you know, there's double indexing, so they're able to have a verification, and it's done in, in discrete batches, so people can do it in the spare time in just a little bit, and they have levels of oversight as well, so you have people that are, are able, uh, you can ask questions if you're one of the indexers. Um, and no one's getting paid for this. Uh, they do it because they think it's worthwhile. Another kind of, of uh, crowdsourced compensation is, is through piecemeal payment. iStock Photo, uh, stock images are a big thing now online. Anyone can t put their photos that they own or that they've taken up on a site like iStock Photo and sell them. And, and you know maybe you get t $10 for that really cool sunset picture that you took and it can be a kind of passive income. And this way, they're able to crowdsource a, a lot more variety of, of types of photography than professional photographers would do. And, and uh, that's a, a boon for the people that are trying to find uh, inexpensive, good photography. I've, I've bought images off of iStock Photo for some of my blog posts and been very pleased and to be able to find things there a lot better than through a general web search looking for public domain images or Creative Commons license images. And, and so that's, that's a benefit for both the, pe the um, amateur photographers who can make a small passive income and also for people that are looking for inexpensive uh, stock photography. The, the most sophisticated kinds of compensation um, they're, they're very they're competitive. They have like top coder, it's, it's uh, here's a programming problem. Whoever can solve this the best will, I think, get a money prize and, and some street cred among other programmers. Innocentive is another uh, platform that's like that. Uh, an example from that is um, someone, uh, let's see, some company put out a, a call for, they wanted to create a product, a kind of dish soap that changed color when the right amount of dish soap had been added to a sink full of water. Now, you know, can that even be done? Well, they put that out there. And I think there was some woman in the Middle East or something like that, that she wasn't even, a, um, she'd never had a career in chemistry, but she'd been trained in it. I don't know if she even had her degree in it, but she figured out how to do that. And so she said, it's all blind as well. People don't know um, who's solving the problem and, and until the problem is solved and the company says, great, this is solved, it. Um, here's the money. And, and so there's this incentive then to use your skills and maybe your amateur skills in order to solve big problems that other people have that they, their own company members cannot solve. All right, so that that's an overview of the different types of um, compensation and laborers and labor that's done with crowdsourcing. I, I want to now just touch briefly on where this is happening across a number of different fields in society. 
I want you to understand that it's not just happening in, uh, say, computer science or software uh, or, or even in technical fields, but it, it's, it's really broadly being applied in many different areas. Uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned journalism. There are a lot of uh, um, platforms now that are enabling people to submit their own stories. Even some of the, the major news out outlets now, they have a way by which the people who formerly were the, just the audience or the readers of their newspapers to uh, submit stories on their own. Uh, you can also fund a story. So you can fund a journalist to go to a foreign country and report on something. Um, that's journalism. This is really interesting. In law and government, there's a, an, an effort to uh, crowdsource government transparency. So there's this thing called openregs.com. And what it does, it takes the freely available uh, information from government databases and it reformats it so that people can, can actually get it in a, in a decent format and it, it, they can read it on an iPhone app and they can, it can be put into a discussion forum. And so these are citizens that are saying, you know, okay, our country has made available these regulations as it should, but not always in, in the format that really makes them as um, available and, and something you can act on as well. So someone is, has uh, crowdsourced making government regulations more accessible. Uh, people are doing similar things with a, a service called Judgepedia, which is an in interactive encyclopedia of courts and judges. Uh, wikis are another kind of, of um, crowdsourcing. Uh, Wikipedia is probably the biggest example of that. And there are these other niche encyclo online encyclopedias, Wikipedias, that are doing the same kind of thing. Um, Crowdsourced legal research is available. Uh, there's one I didn't put on here called PopVox, which is an effort to use like a, a, a mobile device applications as a way to find out what's going on in Congress. So I can go on my iPad and look up who my representatives are in Congress and see how they're voting, uh, and have on the you know very current information about what's going on. And, and so people can be more part of the democratic process. So crowdsourcing here is going hand in hand with democracy. Uh, money is, is very obvious where the crowd is coming in with money that uh, many people have heard of Kickstarter where, where various projects, whether they're business startups or artistic projects, um, people, they'll define their project and, and provide incentives at different levels of contributions and then set a, an amount that they want to have Maybe they they're, want to make an animated movie and they feel they need $30,000 to do that. So people pledge a certain amount and uh, the money is not taken from their accounts unless the entire amount is pledged. It's an interesting model. Uh, Kiva is another uh, crowdfunding platform. This is for microenterprise in the developing world. Um, and uh, a lot of people are now familiar with GoFundMe, which is anyone can make a call for money for any cause at all and uh, it's a way of involving friends to chip in on something. Um, just last night I was at a, at a party where someone was telling me that uh, she wanted to take a group of special education students up to an aquarium and it, she needed a few hundred dollars to do that and her school wouldn't pay for that so she put it up on GoFundMe and everybody chipped in and she was able to take her students to the aquarium. So this is something that's really working right now. Uh, we're finding new ways of, of um, uh, new causes and new new motivations to contribute to things. Uh, money is working differently online because we can do things as a crowd with our money. Science and medicine. This is fascinating. Um, crowdsourcing participants for social science or um, you have things like um, scientists will put a webcam up to um, on an animal in a zoo or something like that and so you can have people that will surveil, that will watch over that animal, not the scientists, but just you know people that care about animals. And uh, the, there are people that are uh, crowdsourcing cures for various diseases. Um, anytime people go online and ask for help for a medical condition is a kind of informal crowdsourcing. But now there are platforms being developed where uh, tough problems in science are, are able to be solved through, through crowdsourcing. Um, let's see. No, I didn't want to tell that one yet. Another one about science I wanted to mention 
was um, it's a platform called I think it's called Foldit, and what it it's done is it's taken um, the task of figuring out molecules, protein proteins, and how they fold, and it's turned it into an online game, and so it it's uh, taking people's interest in gaming, but it, turning it into a way of crowdsourcing solving uh, how how certain proteins fold, so figuring out how mo mo certain molecules function. Uh, I already mentioned Compose as a thing in, in arts, open source cinema. That's uh, I think that that's closed down, but there are, are similar things like that available. Um, recently, the entire play of, of Hamlet was crowdsourced um, by way of the short videos people put up on Instagram. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways that people are uh, well, let's see, another interesting one was uh, uh, the entirety of the original Star Wars movie was was recreated by amateurs. Each of them had, I think, exactly one minute of the entire film, and people submitted their one minute, and it came in all kinds of different styles. And it obviously, that's tied in with fan culture, uh, and there's a lot of different artistic efforts now that involve the crowd. One that I find really fascinating is crisis management. There is this service called Ushahidi, and this started in uh, 2008 in Kenya, where there was a civil unrest following the uh, elections that were held there. Uh, a lot of concern about uh, voter fraud and things like that. This kind of hits close to home because my, my son was actually in Kenya at the time and, and was dodging uh, tear gas in the, in the streets. There, there's a lot of um, concern about watching over democratic processes and also um, addressing emergencies. So this, this Ushahidi is a Swahili word and essentially they created a platform for people to help out with the crisis. So they will teach people what the volunteer organizations are and what those organizations need and then they will, uh, here's an example, they will um, use an op another open platform, OpenStreetMap, and so during the recent earthquake in Nepal, uh, you got people who would take the um, Google Maps or other maps and identify the hot spots where there were problems. And that would, that would help the government and other aid agencies in, in what they had to do. And, and then they, they would also, they've created this way of putting up tasks. So this task was they needed people to identify on maps where good landing spots would be for helicopters. And you can see the little bar at the top saying that this is 89% completed. And and uh, some of these, then they're crowdsourced, but then they are also vetted by experts after the fact. But the crowd is able to do a kind of triaging of first level of looking at things so the experts don't have their time wasted on, on all the detail. It's pretty fascinating. And, and since 2008, um, it's now 2015, in that time, they've gotten better and better at teaching people how to coordinate among different agencies online. And and uh, they keep a blog and they have little how-tos and so on. And and so whether it's the, the earthquake in Haiti or or the the one in, in Japan, Ushahidi has, has really been there. Um, and they have uh, a lot of people that keep improving the very tools as they use them. Now all of that, to me, makes me think about crowdsourcing as being not just a, an interesting phenomenon of online life, but people are working together. And, you know, in history, when people are working together to solve problems and to deal with things like money and science and medicine and the arts, we call this civilization. And so to me, it really, uh, crowdsourcing is not just an interesting business phenomenon or something like that, outsourcing. It's civilization building. Uh, as you see the, the goodwill and the efforts that go in to something like that crisis management, uh, it's, it's really quite sobering to see how much people want to work together and how much they can uh, as they take advantage of the various tools that are there. And they're able to cross boundaries and borders and, and uh, cut through red tape and build things and do things we've always wanted to do in civilization but somehow to move past a lot of the boundaries that, are, that build up through bureaucracies or through just the um, limits of infrastructure. Uh, you know, you get some people with cell phones on the ground, 
uh, figuring out the streets that still exist in Haiti after the earthquake and then reporting that out to someone online and that person puts it up on a map and someone else translates it into um, into French or, or whatever other language is needed in a, for the people that are on the ground um, people are working together so I just kinda wanna end by thinking about crowdsourcing as not just being oh, a curiosity of digital culture but it might be a way that digital culture is becoming a digital civilization or rather that the digital world is helping us to recreate civilization and it's not just about being online the online tools are making things matter um, offline as well so that is my little speech about crowdsourcing there's a lot more to it uh, a lot of uh, current things going on a lot of things developing in this area I encourage you to research it on your own